This is the fourth session of the course on sustainable development. And in this presentation, we will highlight several social scientific theories related to the transition to a post-industrial society. We will focus in particular on the notion of ecological modernization, which has come over the past two decades to serve as the conceptual framework for organizing policy agendas to pursue sustainable development in the economically advanced countries. This discussion will serve to establish the background for understanding and appreciating current interest in fields like industrial ecology and ecological design that we will discuss during the subsequent two sessions. Just a clarifying note before we begin. As usual, there are several supplementary side activities included in this presentation. Most of them, either in the form of news articles or video or audio clips, are accessible as direct downloads from the course website. In a couple of instances, I was not able to capture and post the content due to access restrictions. In these cases, I have provided the web address for you to view them at their source. Some of these websites preface their downloads with short advertisements. I apologize for this annoyance. As just noted, it is the theory of ecological modernization that we will focus most of our attention on during this session. We will, however, review some of the antecedents from which this more recent perspective derives. To begin, then, ecological modernization is a social and political theory that has come to provide the contextual framework for policy design around sustainable development in several advanced nations. It occupies a prominent position in environmental social science as a way to understand the direction that the group of wealthy countries is currently moving. It is important to recognize at the outset that the notion of ecological modernization principally focuses on relatively affluent societies and, at least to my mind, is not directly applicable to developing countries though this is a matter of some debate. I'd like to begin with a brief history lesson because it is best to situate ecological modernization within the sweep of modernization that has occurred over the last several hundred years. By necessity, this review will focus on European history as it is out of Europe that the most important forces of modernization have emanated during this period of time. The past few hundred years of Anglo-European history can be divided into three relatively distinct phases, beginning with a pre-modern phase. Pre-modernity, extending in much, of the northern, in much of northern and western Europe until the latter portion of the 18th century, was primarily characterized by agrarian systems of production. Relatively small-scale artisan crafted production and comparatively low levels of urbanization. The Industrial Revolution began to gather momentum during the latter decades of the 18th century first in England, and then throughout other European countries, and eventually elsewhere. The prominence of agrarian lifestyles began to give way to industrial production and associated modes of living. Industrial cities like Manchester, Leeds, and Birmingham began to develop as important manufacturing centers and pre-modernity started to recede as the modern era took hold. Urbanization gathered momentum as people migrated from rural hinterlands to the growing industrial cities. These processes of industrialization and population concentration 
brought about the emergence of new environmental problems, what we can construe as the so-called design flaws or side effects of modernity. It is inaccurate to view the Industrial Revolution as a single continuous event. Rather, the Industrial Revolution was comprised of at least three separate, smaller industrial revolutions. The first Industrial Revolution started in approximately 1780 and carried on until about 1825 and was largely premised on technological advances in textile production in Northern England. These were the dark satanic mills described by the poet William Blake, an image that continues to inform much of our understanding of the early years of the Industrial Revolution. It also merits observing the slow pace of any substantive mitigation to address the horrid health conditions created by early European industrialization. For instance, the British Parliament did not feel compelled to take action on London's chronic sewage problem until 1858, when the House of Commons had to be evacuated due to the fetid odors emanating from the River Thames. One of the most evocative accounts of environmental conditions during the early Victorian era was written by Frederick Engels with the title The Condition of the Working Class in England and published in 1844. I've posted an extract from the book to the course website and would encourage you to take a brief break now to read in particular page 51, start at the break in the column on the left side of the page, to page 53, where there is a break in the column on the right side of the page. This passage describes in graphic detail the absolutely appalling conditions that existed in the areas of Manchester inhabited by the working classes. The descriptions contained in this passage should purge any sense of nostalgia that you may have for this period. Moreover, the situation was not confined by any means to Manchester, and similar conditions could be found in all of the early industrial cities in Europe, and in due course came to characterize urban life in the United States during the 19th century as well. To proceed then, the second industrial revolution was primarily motivated by scientific developments in metallurgy and chemistry in Germany. Indeed, the eventual establishment of technical or polytechnical institutes like NJIT was prompted by an economic need to bring this knowledge from Germany to the United States. The third industrial revolution, starting at the onset of the 20th century, has been organized around electrical engineering and began with the telephone and eventually spread to the development of computers. This sort of historical retrospective inevitably prompts one to ask, given this ineluctable progression, where do we go from here? Or perhaps more systematically, most of today's advanced industrial societies have evolved over the last 250 or so years, from a phase of pre-modernity to a phase of modernity or industrial modernity. Some social scientists contend that we are in the process now of moving towards a new phase of ecological modernity. Ecological modernity is the phase of societal development where, in the words of some proponents of this concept, advanced industrial societies will correct the design flaws or the side effects of the modern age. 
By this they mean that the social and environmental problems created during the modern era will come to be resolved by an explosive transformation predicated upon new technologies and more creative and effective systems of governance. We should, however, not delude ourselves into thinking that this transition from modernity to pre-modernity will be effortless and painless. The prior evolution from pre-modernity to modernity was a wrenching and treacherous process. From the ultimately unsuccessful effort to do away with the medieval commons, through the enclosures that created private land holdings, to the horrors of the early industrial era chronicled by Engels, to the horrors of World War I and World War II, brought about massive pain and suffering. One would like to hope that the transition to ecological modernity will not be as treacherous, but we need to be honest with ourselves and aware of the historical record. There will be, well, there is currently, resistance to a coming age of ecological modernization. We will need, in the first instance, to get off fossil fuels, and efforts to do so will mobilize opposition from interests from oil companies to coal miners, who will fight this process every step of the way. It will not be a continuous process of steady change, but rather a protracted series of steps forward and backward. There will be a lot of teeth grinding and hair pulling. Indeed, I would suggest that we are already seeing some of that start to play out as the end of the fossil fuel era begins to come into view. The theory of ecological modernization, in many respects, is an extension of several prior conceptions of post-industrial transformation. In the following slides, I will point briefly to four prior theoretical perspectives that have informed the contemporary theory of ecological modernization in various ways. I'm going to talk here about four legendary figures, Walter Rostow, Simon Kuznets, Nikolai Kondratiev, and Joseph Schumpeter. Walter Rostow was a prominent American economist, political economist, and presidential policy advisor. In addition to academic posts at Oxford and Cambridge Universities and MIT, he served as a key economic and foreign policy expert to Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. He was a staunch anti-communist and played an important role in formulating American policy in Southeast Asia during the years of the Vietnam War. Rostow is remembered today for putting forth a theory outlining a linear stage sequence of development, or the takeoff theory of growth. This framework conceptualizes development as starting with traditional societies that enter a transitional phase, health conditions improve, life expectancy increases, scarcity starts to abate, and social strife and conflict subside. These conditions allow societies to then hit a takeoff phase in which growth increases rapidly, social conditions improve markedly, and the size and scale of the economy enters a highly dynamic period of expansion. With the passage of time, circumstances stabilize, the rate of growth diminishes, and the society enters a maturity phase. In the culmination of this stage process, society evolves into an affluent consumer society. We can see from the figure here that different countries have moved through these sequential phases at different periods of time. Britain got the first jump with the onset of the Industrial Revolution during the latter part of the 18th century, 
and subsequently reached maturity earlier than anyone else. Other countries, most notably France, Germany, and the United States, were a bit later in getting into the game. Their takeoffs did not take place until the middle of the 19th century. Major developing countries like China and India are just reaching the point of takeoff now, according to this framework. The major European countries in the United States reached maturity during the years prior to World War II and after the war evolved into mass consumption societies. A second theoretical approach, one that has some close similarity with Rostow's concept of linear stages of growth, was formulated by the Nobel laureate economist Simon Kuznets. Among other achievements, Kuznets helps, helped to found the field of development economics and worked with the U.S. federal government to establish its system for measuring gross domestic product. Relevant for current purposes is Kuznets' contention that economic growth tends to first exacerbate income inequality, but that as development proceeds, and income per capita increases, the gap subsequently narrows. This phenomenon is due to the fact that the economies of less developed societies tend to be based upon agriculture, a form of production that equalizes incomes across households. As a society develops, and as agriculture gives way to industrial production, Per capita income increases, but income inequality does as well. This trend is represented by the upward slope of the graph. With the passage of time, Kuznets demonstrated, public demand for high quality universal education and other social services lead to a decline in income inequality. This notion was a very powerful idea in the field of development economics during the 1960s and 1970s, where the belief was that the aim of development policy was to try to push developing countries past the inflection point as quickly as possible. Indeed, lots of empirical data at the time seemed to suggest that Kuznets, Kuznets was correct. Indeed, countries like Taiwan and South Korea became celebrated models of how strategies grounded in this idea could pay off. And it provides a pretty nice picture. Though we should not forget that these two countries were subject to authoritarian rule during the period of their takeoff stages. The conclusion, though, at the time was that underdevelopment was not irresolvable with effective policy measures and diligence to keep the lid on social unrest, the dividends down the road could be considerable. During the early 1990s, some environmental economists at the World Bank began to develop the view that the Kuznets curve did not just apply to income inequality, but that one could also use this perspective to explain environmental quality. During the early stages of transition from an agricultural to an industrial economy, the environmental costs of economic growth could be quite sizable. However, as the material standard of living improved, this would bring about a commitment to democracy and transparent systems of governance the public would mobilize the demand that government impose increasingly comprehensive regulatory controls as it approached the point of becoming a post-industrial economy that would protect public health from industrial pollution and environmental conditions would steadily improve with increasing per capita income. The concepts of both the Kuznets curve and the environmental Kuznets curve have been very influential. And as I noted earlier, they tell a relatively comforting story. 
economic development is not inconsistent with a high level of environmental quality. We could, indeed we should, continue along more or less the same path we are on, and all will be okay in the end, as long as we have perseverance and the fortitude to stick with the program. The problem, however, is that with the passage of time, it has become apparent that the Kuznets curve and the environmental Kuznets curve are not correct. Economic growth does, it does not in and of itself lead to sustained reductions in either income inequality or environmental quality. Let us turn our attention now to the third figure in this group. Nikolai Kondratiev was a Russian economist who was appointed government minister of food supply in 1917. He favored a policy predicated upon the primacy of agriculture and the production of consumer goods. He had a short-lived period of prominence as a government official, but was ultimately imprisoned by Stalin. He served eight years in jail before being executed in 1938. The bulk of his work was not translated into English until 1998. Kondratiev observed that Western business cycles were subject to 50 to 60 year cycles of boom and bust, and each wave was organized around a particular mode of technological innovation. The first of these waves was part of the upsurge during the latter part of the 18th century that gave rise to the first industrial revolution predicated on textile production. This wave eventually crested, and after a downward cycle, a new wave emerged based on the railroad and steel production. The past 150 years has seen three further waves, one centered on oil, automobiles, and electricity, and extending from the latter decades of the 19th century until the end of the first third of the 20th century, and then two more organized around military technologies developed during the First and Second World Wars. Proponents of Kondratiev's work have further extended his framework to the present day and identified financial innovation as the driving force of economic expansion during the latest wave of growth. If one accepts the basic premise of this observation, and there would seem to be little reason to fault it, the question that emerges is where we are presently situated with respect to the current rate wave and what is likely to be the basis of the next wave. Joseph Schumpeter was an Austrian-born economist who eventually moved to the United States and was something of an intellectual rival of Kuznets's. Schumpeter was a scholar of entrepreneurship and innovation at Harvard, but is most remembered today for building on the work of Kondratiev and for coining the term gales of creative destruction. What he meant by this evocative metaphor was that destruction was an essential feature of capitalist development. And from the remains of prior technological waves, new ideas and practices emerged. Painful and difficult though it might be, it was necessary to periodically, approximately every 60 to 70 years in accordance with Kondratiev's waves, to clear away the dying relics of earlier techno-economic eras in order to build the foundation of the next era of energetic activity. The implication here is that if progress, at least as conventionally understood, is to be maintained, we should not retain attachments to the bygone era, and in some cases we should hasten its demise, because it is through the death of once powerful industries that financial, technical, and human resources are freed up to give life to newly innovative sectors. 
We should thus not mourn the demise of the American automobile industry and its reliance on vehicles powered by the internal combustion engine. From this perspective, all the money spent on bailouts to General Motors and Chrysler is a waste of resources that could be better used to cultivate new modes of mobility. It is further frequently observed that if the hundred largest companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange today, only five were around 100 years ago. Such evidence is meant to highlight the extraordinary churn that is a key characteristic of capitalist development. We should clear away the wreckage of bygone times to allow the system to renew itself. Schumpeter's ideas remain at the heart of the field of innovation studies and innovation theorizing today. I would be remiss if I did not note in passing that some business analysts and stock market forecasters are quite keen enthusiasts of the ideas of Kondratiev and Schumpeter, and there is no shortage of effort to apply them to predict movements of the stock market based on long cycles of innovative dynamism. I'll leave it to each of you to decide whether they are useful for this purpose, but the larger point here is that there are some predictable patterns of innovation that occur over time, and that these patterns do hold important relevance. The trick is to be more specific about the precise mechanisms that enable new waves to arise on such a seemingly predictable schedule. This background enables us to now talk about ecological modernization in more salient terms. The assertion of this perspective is that ecological modernity will be characterized by a new industrial revolution organized around advanced environmental technologies that will correct the design flaws or the side effects of modernity. These technologies will be fundamentally different from the sorts of largely mitigative approaches to addressing environmental problems to which we have been accustomed. Rather, a new generation of environmental technologies will fundamentally transform industrial production by generating zero waste and achieving several fold improvements in energy and materials efficiencies. The ultimate objective is to decouple economic growth from environmental performance and to generate value added while reducing energy and materials inputs. Countries at the forefront of early industrial revolutions were able to achieve significant comparative economic advantages, and nations that are the pioneers of ecological modernity will reap similar benefits. In this sense, the prospect of a new industrial revolution poses a very different vision of the future than conventional, so-called small is beautiful, theories of environmental reform predicated on calls for what we can term demodernization. The notion of small is beautiful derives from a classic book from the early 1970s by E.F. Schumacher that popularized a vision of a decidedly human-centered world based on so-called appropriate technology. The book has continued to serve as an important touchstone for particular strands of contemporary environmental thought oriented around a kind of escapism or retreatism from the harsh realities of the world. Without overly stereotyping this view, it offers a somewhat nostalgic strategy that to a large degree aims to revert to a simpler time. Such ideas are no doubt attractive, for a variety of reasons. Indeed, on some days I find myself quite seduced by them, and they regularly draw adherence from any number of walks of life. However, the plausibility of their practical implementation on anything more 
on a small-scale experimental basis is highly questionable. It is fair to observe that ecological modernization emphasizes pragmatism over utopianism. Nonetheless, the ideas enshrined in the notion of small is beautiful, regardless of whether they are feasible or not from a policy implementation perspective, provide a good counterpoint for appreciating the intent of ecological modernization. Instead of endorsing a backward-looking view, proponents of ecological modernization contend that we cannot turn the clock back. We need to move ever forward and commit ourselves to a new industrial revolution. We need to, perhaps paradoxically, embrace many of the same forces that gave rise to modernity to power us into ecological modernity. Ecological modernization that thus presents a radically different view of the future than is conventionally advanced by mainstream environmentalism. As such, there is a great debate raging about the merit and viability of this approach. It bears observing, however, that over the past 20 years, ecological modernization has become an increasingly central and relatively uncontroversial, I might add, feature of European policymaking. I would contend that ecological modernization has made decidedly less progress in the United States, in part because of a lack of political capacity in this country to formulate coherent industrial policies and to forge linkages across different policy domains. We have, in many respects, become prisoners of our own dogma. We celebrate unbridled free markets and regularly denigrate government intervention of virtually all kinds, yet, is yet it is impossible to set and to work toward priorities consistent with ecological modernization without some degree of top-down planning. So we, are, so we are a bit like the mythological hydra-headed monster. All variety of special interests pull in different directions instead of committing to a path and working in concert. Having said this, though, there are numerous prominent voices in the United States articulating ideas that are highly consistent with ecological modernization, and we will consider several of them during the remainder of this presentation and in future sessions. Figures like Amory Lovins, Bill McDonough, Stuart Brand, Ray Kurzweil, and Peter Senge may not invoke the formal terminology of ecological modernization, yet their strategic recommendations are highly eco-modernist in their content. In addition, the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman is a powerful and consistent voice for ecological modernization in a more popular vein. Indeed, it is a rare week when Friedman does not devote at least a portion of one of his twice-a-week columns to what he terms the ET revolution, the environmental technology revolution. Let me suggest that we take at this point a brief break to do three things. First, I would like you to first view the film clip on the course website about Amory Lovins and the activities of his Rocky Mountain Institute based in Snowmass, Colorado. Second, I encourage you to read the Tom Friedman column contrasting the ecological modernization efforts of Denmark and the United States. Please also listen to the short radio program accessible via the link provided on the bottom of this slide. Finally, a question of critical importance is the degree to which China is embarking on a pathway 
that might be characterized as having certain qualities consistent with ecological modernization. This question was taken up in a recent PBS common documentary series entitled Design E Squared that examines an effort in China to address the country's vast environmental challenges. This segment runs for about 20 minutes. With some of the instructive insights offered by these film and audio clips and news articles, we can now begin to delineate six key tenets of ecological modernization. The first tenet of ecological modernization is a commitment to what is known within the context of this theoretical framework as super-industrialization. This commitment not only to industrialization, but to super-industrialization, may at first seem ironic. After all, is not industrialization the source of many of our sustainability problems? Is it not the case that we need less rather than more industrialization? Proponents of ecological modernization turn conventional thinking on its head. They contend that contemporary unsustainability derives not from too much industrialization, but rather from not enough, or more precisely, not enough of the right kind. To resolve the design flaws and to reconcile the side effects of the current age, we need to redouble our commitment to industrialization and through such means forge a pathway into the next phase of societal evolution. The second tenet of ecological modernization centers on adopting a new regulatory philosophy based on the precautionary principle. I could spend a considerable amount of time talking about the precautionary principle, but will necessarily be relatively brief here. The customary regulatory philosophy for engaging with environmental issues, especially in the United States, has traditionally been based on seeking to resolve problems after the fact, rather than proactively in advance. As such, we generally impose the legal burden for demonstrating the hazardousness of new technologies and practices on putative victims, not on the perpetuators of novel activities. The prevailing motto is safe until proven dangerous. As a result, we allow new chemicals to be introduced into the marketplace without adequate testing of their safety. This cartoon may be overly expressive to some, but it speaks an important truth. We subscribe to reactive regulatory philosophies because we do not want to slow down the wheels of commerce or impose undue burdens on industrial firms. It is therefore up to the victims, who may not become victims themselves until a point of time significantly far in the future, to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have been harmed. Oftentimes, we are talking about health effects say cancer, that are latent and do not become manifest until 10 or more years down the road. Moreover, determinations of causality are often difficult to prove within the organizational structure of an adversarial legal setting. We could talk at length about the fairness or equity of such a legal posture, but it is an accurate characterization of the prevailing situation. The precautionary principle takes the opposite approach. It suggests that responsibility for demonstrating safety rests with those parties that are advocating for implementation of a risky technology or activity. We should not knowingly allow real-world experiments to be conducted on human bodies and the ecosystem. 
This does not mean that we should just sit on our hands and conduct an endless series of tests to determine whether something is safe, but that we should pre proceed far more prudently than we typically do, and we should be prepared to back off when concerns about efficacy or safety begin to emerge. From the standpoint of a currently relevant example, transportation officials in the United States should have acted, it would appear, far more quickly than they did to address the problem of faulty brakes and accelerator pedals on some Toyota automobile models, instead of allowing the situation to incubate the way that it apparently did. For that matter, Toyota itself should have taken more assertive action on its own accord. The response instead was to privilege economic prerogatives, the continued success of Toyota's North American operations, over the safety and well-being of car owners and others. On another front, the Food and Drug Administration should have acted more efficiently and effectively to address the problems of the prescription painkiller Vioxx at a much earlier point in time instead of allowing the product to be distributed after it became apparent that there were health issues associated with patient use of it. Our response to climate change should arguably be driven by a more precautionary decision-making framework given the potentially catastrophic risks that we face. The third tenet of ecological modernization is not unrelated to the second one and asserts that industrial firms need to embrace a more thorough sense of organizational responsibility with respect to their environmental performance. It is not simply a matter of complying with legal mandates and operating within the letter of the law. Laws that we need to recognize were adopted only after lengthy periods of negotiation with industrial operators themselves. To engage in environmentally problematic activities is a failure of adequate managerial effectiveness. Aspiring only to enhance the company's bottom line is a signal of a dangerous focus on the short term. Firms from top management all the way down the line need to be ethically cognizant of their responsibilities as members of a larger community. Ecological modernization reminds us that corporations, in particular large and economically and politically powerful corporations, have been chartered, in other words, they've been given a legal right to exist, to fulfill a social purpose, not simply to generate wealth for managers and stockholders. Let us take another time out here to view two short film clips featuring Peter Senge, speaking to this issue. Both of them are available on the course website. Fourth, we are accustomed in many instances of thinking about environmental regulations as a cost for business. In other words, firms are being required by law to do something that they would not be motivated on their own to do. Indeed, much of the environmental legislation currently on the books is prompted precisely by this impulse. Ecological modernization turns the relationship between performance and regulation upside down. Regulation is not just a punitive cost. We need to get beyond the idea that regulation is a way to induce people and firms to stay within the letter of the law and to slap them on the wrist when they transgress. We can think of this as dumb regulation. If designed creatively and applied judiciously, smart environmental regulation, indeed all regulation, can be a spur to innovation. The operative metaphor here is that regulation can function like a coach continually prodding and conjoling an athlete in various ways to upgrade and improve his performance. Regulation can be a source of inspiration that helps us get to a better place by setting goals and providing a systemic strategy to get there. 
This is probably a strange notion from an American perspective because we are so accustomed to viewing government as, at best, a necessary evil rather than a wellspring of benevolence. Part of this dilemma is our own making in that we malign and incapacitate government in various ways so that in the end it is ineffectual in many respects. This is not the case in much of Europe particularly in the northern European countries where there is a high expectation that government will perform effectively and capably. This is certainly the case in Denmark as outlined in the Friedman article and the Marketplace radio report from earlier in this presentation. While I do not mean here to overstate the case, I think it is fair to say that Danes have high expectations for their government and the government, for the most part, meets these expectations. Pause the recording here one more time to listen to another short radio report available at the link at the bottom of this site, of this slide, that makes this point in a way that might be somewhat surprising to customary American sensibilities. Fifth. Moving toward ecological modernization is going to be difficult to achieve in political systems characterized by fragmentation and fractiousness. Countries that are relatively homogeneous in socioeconomic terms are likely to have a capacity to devote greater effort and energy to seeking consensus solutions to the challenges of ecological modernization rather than to more customary political battles like how to apportion the proceeds of economic growth. This tenet, I think, is critical to understanding the situation of the United States with respect to ecological modernization. Many of the problems of the modern age, how to deliver effective education, how to provide adequate and relatively affordable health care, how to share responsibilities for training people for future-oriented careers have for the most part been resolved in the northern European countries. These were the political battles of the last three or four decades. They have been contested and largely effective strategies have been implemented to address them. These countries have been able to move on to a new generation of problems. This, I am afraid, is decidedly not the case in, in the United States where these kinds of issues continue to fester without, in some cases, any real prospect for successful resolution. At the same time, the system of multi-party governing coalitions throughout Europe provides a political stability that is largely absent from the United States where the two-party system promotes division, divisiveness, and stifles political cohesion. Another recent piece by New York Times columnist Tom Friedman highlights the apparent emergence of concern in some corners of the world about growing political instability in the United States. And you may want to stop this narration at this point to read that story. The final tenet of ecological modernization is that environmental improvement becomes a keystone of innovation. Rather than innovating around reducing labor, lowering costs, or ramping up scale to sell more product, the foci of innovation in the United States, in particular over the past several decades, the improvement of environmental performance to save energy, to reduce materials utilization, to remedy the biophysical problems created by consumption and production, become the driving motivations for both public and corporate strategy. Indeed, a central element in this respect, as we will discuss in future weeks, is to eliminate physical products by dematerializing or ephemeralizing their essential functionality. I ask that you stop the recording here one last time and turn your attention for a few minutes to the last side activity for this session, an article entitled 
Europeans revitalize plants to save jobs that makes this last tenant particularly apparent. Let me shift gears slightly now and pose the question of why it might be in the interests of industrial managers to embrace ecological modernization. In the first instance, pollution can be viewed as a sign of waste. Not only is pollution a sign of waste, it is a signal of an engineering flaw in the way that a production process has been designed. After all, why would anyone want to spend money on material and energy inputs that do not find their way into the final product? In other words, why invest resources in molecules that add costs, but nothing to value added? Ferreting out sources of waste thus becomes a way to heightened efficiencies and improved profitability. In the language of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, pollution prevention pays. Second, drawing on what we discussed in the context of the precautionary principle, ecological modernization recognizes that it is cheaper to proactively address environmental problems early on rather than further down the road. It can be less costly to, to design a high level of environmental responsibility or, in the language of ecological modernization, environmental intelligence, into products instead of producing commodities that are burdened with future legacies of environmental disregard from the minute they leave the factory gate. Third, I think it's fair to say that customers consumer demand for greener consumption is increasing. A green identity can confer marketing and promotional benefits. While these goods may be slightly more expensive, it is just as easy for a consumer to select a nominally green product from the shelf as it is for her to pull a non-green alternative. Also, for better or worse, greener modes of consumption provide people with a relatively easy way to make themselves feel better about the ill effects of their otherwise consumerist lifestyles and to demonstrate to themselves and to others a certain degree of environmental responsibility. This is the notion that is effectively captured by the quip, yes I drive a sport utility vehicle but I buy chlorine free paper towels made with recycled content. There is obviously much to be critical about here, but we will set that aside for the time being. The point is that manufacturers that are able to wrap themselves in a certain green image are likely to reap financial benefits. Fourth, there is, quite frankly, money to be made in producing and selling advanced environmental technologies. This is the story of Siemens, profiled in the prior news article. Whether we are talking about wind turbines, solar cells, or electric cars, there is substantial evidence that, the, that these are the opportunities of the future, and companies that can upgrade their capabilities to grab a piece of these markets will do well in coming decades. In the final series of slides for this session, let me pose a few questions about this claim that we, or at least some countries, are moving toward ecological modernity. We will take up and try to resolve some of these matters in future weeks. The first question then is where does the notion of ecological modernity leave nations, particularly developing nations, that lack the necessary prerequisites for this transformation? Are the ideas inherent in ecological modernization only pertinent for advanced industrial societies? If so, is there anything wrong with that? Do we really need to foster strategies that have universal appeal? Second, 
As, of I, as I have intimated several times in this presentation, I think there are some very big question marks hanging over the head of the United States with respect to its capacity to ecologically modernize. More specifically, where does the United States fit into these putative trends towards ecological modernity? I've personally been involved in this area of activity for 15 years, and during that time the chasm between the United States and Europe with respect to ecological modernization has widened. At the same time, 15 years ago, no one really gave much consideration to the relationship between Asian countries and their prospects of evolution towards some kind of Asian expression of ecological modernity. That is not the case any longer. It seems that the United States is now falling behind not only the Europeans, but several key Asian countries as well. Third, Ecological modernization does not address the geographic displacement of environmental problems. Will developing countries with weak governance structures continue to serve as resource suppliers and waste sinks for the developed world? There is no getting around the problem that a sizable portion of the environmental improvements realized in the United States and Europe over the last few decades have come about by shutting down heavily polluting domestic facilities and opening up new ones in China and elsewhere in Asia. We have just shifted the burden to other places and chalked up a positive score on our side of the environmental accounting ledger. Consumption in this country and in Europe remains largely predicated on what is largely the same shopping basket of goods though now our shopping basket is bigger and the goods come from somewhere else. Fourth, many people, probably with good reason, have drawn attention to the fact that ecological modernization is largely based on a set of technocratic prescriptions and it marginalizes social conflict. The question then is can ecological, can ecological modernization really provide an effective pathway toward sustainability if it fails to engage with deeply seated societal inequities. Fifth, does movement towards ecological modernity mark the abandonment of policy responsibility by governments as a way to create distance from difficult challenges? Does it create new sources of empowerment for multinational corporations in as much as it, it is corporate managers who are largely entrusted with responsibility for driving ecological modernization forward? This seems to be another good question. Finally, and in keeping with what we spoke about in prior weeks about biophysical limits to growth, this is something about which ecological modernization is largely silent. Economic growth of the more or less conventional sort is still anticipated to take place, except now it will be a bit greener and industrial firms will demonstrate greater responsibility for their activities. If planetary resources are in fact limited over the longer term, should this conceptual framework not give some consideration to limiting resource throughputs? We have now reached the end of this presentation. Ecological modernization provides the framework for understanding developments taking place in a number, excuse me, a number of emergent fields, ranging from industrial ecology to ecological design to green chemistry and engineering, to sustainable mobility, and sustainable modes of architecture and building design. We will not be able to devote attention to all of these areas of activity, but in future sessions we will be taking up two of them, namely industrial ecology and ecological design. I look forward to seeing you at the next session.